long discussion. From the book, uh, Wild Awakening. <laughs> I'm very happy to be back here in Bay Area, <clears throat> and especially a uh, great delight well, for me to be back here in Berkeley at Shambhala Center. So, more than 2,500 years ago, there was a young prince in ancient India by the name of uh, Siddhartha, as you all probably know. And this young prince enjoyed all the pleasure that the material world can get. He had everything he desired. His father, a great king of India, provided him everything but suffering. Mm -hmm. And his father was a very successful and very um, skilled in hiding the suffering, which is not very different from our 21st century. <laughs> and we are also, I think, our community is also very skilled in hiding suffering. And so the king hid all the suffering from the young prince. And the prince had everything he wished for in terms of material wealth, joy, enjoyment, everything except Coca-Cola. <laughs> So, this young prince was uh, enjoying such wealth, such enjoyment, and one day the prince uh, felt dissatisfied. And still, no matter how much he had enjoyment of wealth, material world, but still there was a sense of satisfaction deep in his heart. There is a sense of uh, emptiness. I am not talking about emptiness from Madhyamaka <laughs> or Philosophical community, <clears throat> but emptiness in the sense of uh, uh, longing. Something was missing, no matter how much was there in front of him. And so he began to explore more. And he became more interested to explore the life of people in the world. Not just interested in maintaining the illusion of his palace life, royal life with wealth and joy, but also was interested to know about the life in general, the world in general. That's how he began his journey to enlightenment. Right? This is very important. Beginning of his journey to enlightenment was not anything religious, was not anything uh, it was very simple, genuine desire to know. 
That's all. That's what started his journey. <clears throat> Simple desire to know more about life, nature of life, about the world he's living in, and the nature of the world. And that simple desire, right? Uh, that simple sense of uh, quest he had, uh, keen interest that he had, finally led him to the result, fruition of what we call enlightenment, Buddhahood. And so, therefore, this uh, princess journey did not start with a uh, uh, great faith in religion, unfortunately, or fortunately. And his journey to enlightenment did not start with meeting a charismatic guru. His journey to enlightenment did not start with a great faith in supermanly beings like God and so on, or gods. But his journey began with this simple quest, desire for knowledge. And so, therefore, when he requested the king to explore the life of people and the world he is living in, in that whole journey, then one day when the prince was looking out, <clears throat> then he saw four different things, right? I'm sure you, many of you may have heard. You know, first, when he looked out, you know, he saw a uh, an old person, old person, and that old person, the prince had, had never seen any old person. He had never seen any old person, and so when he saw that, he was very keen, you know, genuinely interested to know what is this being. So he asked his friend, "Who is this? You know, what is this being? <laughs> what species?" <laughs> And his friend said, this is a human being. And then he said, this, this person doesn't look like any, anyone I know, anyone I've seen, any one of us. And his the friend said, this is what they call, what we call all age. You know, everyone becomes old and will soon look like this person. And then the prince asked, how about the king and the princess? And his friend said, I'm sorry to inform you, but this also applies saying to everyone, including kings and the princes. <laughs> you know, this is something, you know, we don't have to worry about. It's something uh, existed 2,500 years ago. It's <laughs> <laughs> something called old age. <laughs> We've overcome that now. But, you know, who is ginseng now? <laughs> And same thing happened in the next scene when Prince was looking out. Then he saw uh, a sick person, a very, very ill person. And then the same question, same answers, right? Human being getting ill. And then the third thing he saw was a funeral procession. And the fourth thing he saw was something different for a change. <laughs> the fourth thing he saw was a yogi sitting in a meditation posture. And then he asked his friend again, with a sense of keen interest. Yeah. Nothing more, but just interested to know. And when he asked, this friend said, this is called Rishi, a yogi, meditating. And he's doing this to overcome all the things we've seen in the past. All things, sickness and death. 
And then the prince asked, is that possible? And his friend said, this person believes it is possible. And so that's how his journey began, in a journey to enlightenment. You can see from this very simple story, <coughs> this is a very important part of Siddhartha's journey to enlightenment. This is a very important part of his life for all of us. It is showing that Prince's journey or his quest, his uh, search did not begin with the idea of saying, I know. The way he started his journey is with questioning, saying, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what is in this here. So he started his journey with asking these questions, with saying, I do not know. But he did not start the journey saying, I know what is going on. And knowing what we do not know is the greatest of the story. It's a very difficult to realize sometimes. But if you look, that is the greatest wisdom, knowing what we do not know. And so therefore, such a genuine desire, uh, which we call here innocent desire, you know, wanting to know, wanting to learn, wanting to explore, wanting to penetrate all the way to the core of its reality becomes the most important part of spiritual journey in Buddhism. You know, without this heart, there is no journey of spirituality here in Buddhist uh, path. Without this, there is no real way we can achieve the goal of enlightenment. And so therefore, such pure and genuine desire, genuine heart of exploring, genuine heart of uh, doubt, is very precious, is positive in Buddhism. Skepticism, right? Prince's journey started with skepticism. You know, you do not just sit there and accept everything, say, oh, this is wonderful, or oh, I should continue, I should get more wives and, and more, uh, uh, more of these material things and more of uh, everything. Well, that's not how he started his journey, but he started his journey with asking questions, becoming skeptical, doubtful, not willing to continue the same story of illusion, same game of illusion every day. <coughs> and so therefore, doubt is very positive in Buddhism. You know, doubt is very necessary. Skepticism is one of the foundations of our journey, our path in Buddhism. It's very important. The heart of skepticism, heart of questioning, the heart of uh, uh, Exploring is very important, yet at the same time, our skepticism, our doubt, must lead us to a conclusion, an answer. If our doubt doesn't lead us to an answer, it is not beneficial at the end. Right? If it continues, then it is not healthy. I use the example. It's a funny example. Doubt that it goes on and on, continues, and do not lead us to any conclusion is like run-on sentences. <laughs> That's how we speak in Rasko. <laughs> run-on sentences. You know, when you go on and on like that, you will find no way to put your period. Isn't it? At some point, we must find a spot. <laughs> where we can put a pen, isn't it? 
We can just go on and on and on without doubt and skepticism. If we do, it will lead us to the state of no confusion rather than clarification. It will lead us to the state of more uh, doubt rather than clarifying doubt. And so therefore, at some point, we must find Uh, that's the danger here. 
<coughs> and uh, we can see this from an example, right? From an example that I use, uh, like when we get a new job, it's very exciting, isn't it? The first first day is very exciting, no matter what job it is. <laughs> Maybe it's a job at a hot dog vendor. But still, we can be very excited for our first day of work, right? We can sleep that night. We're so excited. We're waiting for our alarm clock to ring in the morning. <laughs> and rush to our job. It's full of excitement. You know, and we we serve our customers with genuine delight, you know, true delight, and genuine smile. You know, not those kind of thing, you know, uh, customer service thing. <laughs> I get those wrong. You know, but then we, you know, we don't have to go for training for that smile. It comes naturally. You can't hide it. Even if you don't want to hide it, you can't hide it. It is so powerful, so exciting. Yeah, if, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> if, uh, you know, if a hot dog, the vendor job is so exciting, then this uh, journey to enlightenment must be, you know, has to be very exciting when we begin this journey here, this spiritual journey. We can see that the first day of our sitting meditation, the first instruction we receive from our instructors and teachers, you can see that's the best sitting, the first day of exploring our mind, seeing how many thoughts arising, how busy our mind is, how difficult it is to calm our mind, how difficult it is to experience the calmness. You know, that first attempt of ourselves to calm our mind, experience calmness, sit on this cushion and explore the mind and its nature, we can see that day is a very fresh day, exciting day. It is full of excitement, full of joy, full of enthusiasm. Right? That continues. You know, that uh, kind of <coughs> spot <spark. laughs> <laughs> Continues for a while and then. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, just gets weaker and weaker. And so, therefore, the most important thing on our journey here is to always remember why. You know, why we are sitting, why we are doing such and such. You know, this is crucial for our journey, for our journey uh, to enlightenment on the Buddhist path. We must always remind ourselves why. We must always remember to ask questions. We must always remember to find answers from within. With that, if we continue our journey, it will always be fresh. It will always be with a full of sparks, with a full of life, with a full of enthusiasm and joy. Otherwise, at some point, it becomes so mechanical Right, your sitting becomes very mechanical. You know, any other uh, complicated practices also become very mechanical. And then at the end, we end up just counting. And counting and counting. <laughs> right? And all of us, Buddhist practitioners, then we become like an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> Going over our sheets of numbers and 
next and when I finish work and when I, when I can go to the next and so on, you know, then there is something missing, isn't it? Right? Something missing there. Even though you're doing a superb job, right? you're doing great in terms of finishing the numbers. But in terms of really connecting with the reality of uh, your journey, searching mind's reality, searching enlightenment, in, in terms of that, then it is questionable sometimes. So therefore, we must revitalize. You know, revitalize our heart, our journey in everyday life. And uh, the way I feel the most effective way to revitalize is asking questions. Always asking questions and always finding answers from within. Of course, you can rely on some help outside, but basically it has to come from within. You must contemplate. You know, I'm not trying uh, to say that, you know, I, I don't want to answer your questions. <laughs> but the true answer must come from you then. And so, you know, therefore, um, our sitting and our practice of mantra and Vajrayana practices should not be just for counting. But we must see the purpose, the uh, uh, effect of each practice and each method has on realizing our goal of achieving the uh, understanding, experience, and actualization of the nature of our mind. Enlightened in nature. <coughs> and so, therefore, we must learn this very clearly, not only from our experiences, but also from the past examples. So, therefore, for that reason, I'm giving you this account, right? Reminding you of Prince. Siddhartha's beginning of his journey. That's our perfect example. Right? That's the meaning of what we call taking refuge in the Buddha as an example. Uh, as a Buddhist, you know, we don't worship Buddha, but we take refuge in the Buddha as an example, a perfect human example. So, this is the first example, a beginning example. This beginning is also the end. <coughs> Isn't it? If you can connect with such a pure heart, pure inspiration, that is also fruition. And so therefore, um, such finding of a truth, finding the truth, or finding the reality of all phenomena, which we call enlightenment. Uh, the question here is, is, uh, is it possible for us to discover, to find such enlightenment? And the answer <coughs> from the Buddhist teaching is, of course, yes. Yes, it is possible. And not only it is possible for us to find such a enlightenment, but also there are many ways of finding such enlightenment. And now, again, we will sing the song, All These Forms, which is on page 9 of the chapter. Of course. The following
most important part. It's the foundation part of the journey. And then the Mahayana vehicle is known as the greater vehicle because basically uh, because of its having a greater vision and greater practices. Mahayana vision is not just for individual salvation, individual freedom, but for the freedom of all sentient beings, for the enlightenment of all sentient beings. So the vision is greater. And the methods to achieve that are also vast and expensive. And then the Vajrayana method is known as the uh, Vajrayana. Therefore, 
So first we need to put our mental energy into accomplishing a result that we ourselves are capable of accomplishing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if we have, in our everyday life, if we have 20 minutes to really practice meditation, then if you really dedicate that accomplishment, and do it fully, you know, fully, fully participate, fully engage in your practice, then that's more effective than thinking about doing one hour every day. <laughs> <laughs> right, isn't it? You can think about doing one hour every day, but at the end of the month, you have zero hours. <laughs> and zero minutes. <laughs> but if you do 20 minutes every day, if you really have uh, a solid 20 minutes, and if you use it properly, effectively, then at the end of the month,
But what we are lacking is the skills in managing our time and resources. You know, this is an important skill. So we must have a Dharma course, Dharma teaching on how to manage our time and resources in the most effective way. You know, that becomes a very important topic. Yes. And so therefore, this journey to enlightenment um, that what we are discussing here over the weekend is from the point of view of Vajrayana, the third vehicle, uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen approach. We will discuss later and more. Uh, and this approach of Vajrayana is what we call uh, wild approach. In a Vajrayana Tantra, it says, through a difference in one moment, one becomes Buddha in one moment. So, this difference between samsara and nirvana is found in just one moment. The difference is created in only one moment. When we recognize the true nature of things, that is nirvana. And when we don't recognize the true nature of things, that is samsara. And this recognition or non-recognition happens in just one moment. And the recognition and non-recognition are in thus only one moment apart. Therefore, in this very moment, I mean this very moment is the uh, you know, has the two edges. When we recognize in this very moment, it's enlightenment. And when we fail to recognize it here, then it's samsara. And so therefore, wild awakening, the concept of wild awakening, it's taught in Vajrayana Tantras, Vajrayana teachings. And it is referring to the idea of uh, sudden awakening, which also, uh, such a concept also exists in Mahayana teachings, like Zen, Mahayana Buddhism, also taught about sudden awakening. So, therefore, uh, you know, this is what we call wild awakening here. So I'd like to discuss briefly about uh, the concept of wild awakening. Generally speaking, we have lots of ideas about enlightenment, don't we? You know, we have lots of concepts about enlightenment. And we usually think enlightenment should take place in a very sacred, serene, profound environment. That, that's our idea. Like enlightenment takes place in a very quiet, you know, a very nice shrine <laughs> sitting in front of a beautiful shrine and the sacred images and sitting on our very nicely meticulously 
the adult gondolas and burning Asian incense. <laughs> Then, yeah, we become enlightened, right? With our mind very calm, body very quiet, and speech very quiet, environment very quiet, then we become enlightened, right? Either in that environment or maybe under a sacred tree. And 
you can see from other Vajrayana histories that many <coughs> Vajrayana yogis, they left the life of very ordinary people. A great water master, uh, I think his name was Padma Vajra, and he was ordinarily seen as a carpenter in the city. And he had a small carpentry shop. And that's where he practiced, that's where he attained enlightenment, that's where he become, and became a lineage holder and continued many Vajrayana lineage transmissions and teachings of enlightenment. And the same, you know, you can see in the history that some of them were bartenders. Yes. <laughs> 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 you know, many, many different way of practicing. Some of them are just simple farmers, like Martha. Martha was a great farmer. You know, very, uh, uh, what you call, tough farmer. <clears throat> and a little mean. At times, to his neighbor. But that's all right. <laughs> as long as your mind is in perfect calmness. And compassion. And so, therefore, you know, when you look from the Vajrayana point of view, enlightenment, awakening is possible in any moment. So when you look at the such story of Narupa's enlightenment, awakening, you know, with a sandal or flip-flop hitting on his forehead, and then achieving enlightenment, isn't that a pretty wild awakening? And in the same way, when Pamasambhava achieved enlightenment, you know, there is a really uh, interesting story, <laughs> which uh, you may not believe, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> uh, you know, when Pamasambhava was uh, seeing his uh, master, Kunga, uh, she transported Pamasambhava into Sarupa home. And then put it on, on her tongue and swallowed. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Thomas Ambala, she swallowed. And then, you know, when Thomas Ambala came out from the other end, <laughs> he was a totally. <laughs> 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 Very wild awakening. <laughs> 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 so I think this title is very much connected to that story of Thomas and Baba. <coughs> wild awakening. <clears throat> and so therefore, the concept of a wild awakening is connected to the Vajri and the principle of saying that these wild, <clears throat> wild pleasures we have, wild uh, mm. mental afflictions <coughs> we have, Indraja, Shadan, Desire, aggression, ignorance, and so on. It is said that the uh, stronger these mental afflictions get that much, you have more opportunity to achieve enlightenment from the Vajrayana point of view. So Vajrayana do not see you know, these patients, mental afflictions as a bad news. Uh, we in fact see them as a good news. You know, when you have a patient, that's a good news. That's why. You know, Buddha himself said in the Tantras that the Vajrayana teachings will be more beneficial in the future, more effective in the future than at the time of the Buddha. The reason he gave in the Tantra was that Buddha said in the, in the future generations, the gracious mental afflictions will get more wild. They will get more intense more crazy, 
And we can see that right in the world. The afflictions. Nations are getting quite wild everywhere. You know, aggression. Getting wild. Passion getting wild. Ignorance. So when the nations are getting wild, then Buddha said, Tantra, Vajra and teachings will be more effective. Take them into my kingdom. And at that time, they will also be more powerful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, more powerful. And they will have more uh, uh, potential to, to transform, transcend, and achieve enlightenment. Right on the spot. And so therefore, Vajrayana teachings say that uh, these wild pleasures can be a great aid for a practitioner to connect with the true nature of the mind, true enlightened nature of the mind. The more pleasures that there are, there is more more luminosity and more opportunity to recognize the nature of the mind. And so therefore, for these wild cases, we need a wild method, a Vajrayana method of transcending, recognizing the nature of mind, enlightened mind, right on the spot through the knowledge <coughs> of Vajrayana teachings. And so therefore, the concept here of a wild awakening is primarily referring to Vajrayana method of achieving enlightenment. And so, you know, that's a general uh, concept of a wild awakening, <clears throat> and we will discuss in detail about working with Mahamudra and Lokchana approach. And so, for, uh, if you have any questions, I will take some questions tonight, <clears throat> since uh, some of you may be coming just for this evening. If there's no questions, then we will send more comments.
teachings as well as iconographies, if you look at them literally, you know, they can be quite mis uh, misleading. So therefore you need the teachings to explain the meaning behind these symbols. So therefore, you know, it is usually kept a secret because it creates a lot of misunderstanding without it. You said something very provocative uh, at the end, and I wonder if you could add, if you could uh, uh, say more about it when you were saying that the stronger the glaciers, there's actually more potential for like a sudden. Mm -hmm. Could you just develop that thought a little more? I know you probably could do that the rest of the weekend, but <laughs> could you give us a taste of that tonight? <laughs> um. Yes, generally speaking, that uh, when we experience the intense emotions, let's say anger, right? When we have a strong, really strong, you know, intense anger, you experience uh, a moment of non thought. You know, there is a non-thought moment. You know, like when you're really at the peak of this anger, like rage. Like sometimes you feel, you can experience this sense of what we usually call blank. And it's actually a moment of non-thought experience. And uh, you can see how in that moment the reasoning, the logical mind of the samsara does not exist. Right? That's why people don't reason you know, during this moment of anger. Right? Then, in that moment that we break the most valuable thing in our home. We won't do that if we have a reasoning mind, you know, rational mind. Why break this? You know, very precious vase. And you break that vase and you uh, do things that, if you reason, you would never do such things, like shouting at your friend. Never possible. But reasoning do not exist. Many times. And so therefore, you, know, you can see how there's the experience of non-thought, how there's an experience of clarity, <coughs> complete sense of lucidity, a total and if there is, uh, uh, when we have a profound logic and instruction to work with such emotion, right? when these two, two come together, then they become very profound. But when there is no instruction, then it's just ordinary anger, you know, confused anger. And then it continues with our ordinary habitual pattern of, you know, the journey of man. And so therefore, when these two meet together, profound instruction and the experience, and when we implement these instructions in that right moment, then they become extremely powerful, extremely powerful. <clears throat> and the same with the passion. Does that...? Yeah, I think that's helpful. So, so, but... It, 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 in, in the way you were speaking of it, it, it seems to often require a, a kind of pointing out, a kind of a reflection on the part of the teacher to recognize the the uh, the emptiness of that, right, the height of it, the selflessness of it, the emptiness of it. Mm -hmm. um, well, the main point is just relaxing. <coughs> yeah, relaxing in that energy. You're in the raw and the naked energy, and uh, connecting with that basic space, with a certain element of uh, mindfulness, but very little effort, not too much effort, <coughs> but more resting and merging. Thanks.
this might be a rhetorical question or a logical question, but um, in the spirit of inquiry, um, I understand how the, the I understand it through the view of devotion how the student-teacher relationship is really necessary in the Vajrayana path. But if I think of taking refuge in the Buddha as an example, mm -hmm. the Buddha didn't have a guru, mm -hmm. so I don't quite understand the, the duality of that waking up. The Buddha did it, mm -hmm. you didn't have a guru. Then mm -hmm. why in the Vajrayana view is it a necessary thing? Rinpoche, can you just say more about the remainder of the weekend? Uh, what the rest of the weekend was about? <laughs> say it again. Can I say more about uh, what the what the rest of the weekend uh, was about? Well, yeah, previous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We will work with the uh, general. First of all, we will work a little bit with the Mahamudra approach. Uh, like, like the wide awakening itself, you know, half of the part is the Mahamudra, and then there's a Dolce, the second part. So, first we will do Mahamudra, you know, majority part of our weekend here, and then we we'll touch on the Dolce. So there's two things, which is, uh, we have some verses on Mahamudra, you know, working with the Mahamudra, 
general model of the meditation uh, practice, how to work with mind, awakening, opening. And secondly, <coughs> we have also
get attached to them or be attached to pushing it away. <laughs> and um, I guess my question is, that um, seems like staying conscious of a very powerful feelings at the same time as you answered that other question. And in that awareness, there's transformation. Mm -hmm. But when um, extremely strong feelings come, such as fear, mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to experience that and not run away from that. Mm -hmm. um, and not force it away. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about um, the clashes such as fear? Generally speaking, you know, I think um, in order for oneself to deal with the such pleasure without running away or without using other methods, uh, one must have a good ground. One must have a good ground of calmness first. You know, otherwise looking at such pleasure directly or, or being in such a patient becomes a challenge, you know. So my experience or teachings that I have received or seen is suggesting that first we must cultivate the sense of uh, ground, which is totally calm mind. You know, within that calm mind, then if you look at this fear, then you will have no problem of, you know, being with that fear, penetrating that fear, and transforming that fear, trans uh, transcending that fear right there on the spot. There will be no problem. Uh, with the, if you do it on the ground of calm. But if you don't, if you do not start with the ground of calmness in that particular moment, you know, then it becomes challenging for, for you, for us. So therefore, we will try first to do some calmness, you know, like our shamatha, meditation, Mahamudra shamatha, general shamatha, whatever shamatha we use, whatever meditation that makes our mind pretty calm. You know, use that method and then you know, look at that. You know, fear. You know, don't deny. Like you say, do not push away. You know, do not uh, also uh, conceptualize so much. But penetrate that experience. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, sometimes it's really helpful to use analytical meditation. You know, uh, especially with fear. I think analytical meditation is very important. So not only just uh, sitting there to penetrate, but sometimes use analysis. You know, some Buddhist analytical meditation without uh, getting distracted or with the thoughts of analysis, but staying focused yet and you know, like Majama Pena. Or uh, if you really look at fear with analysis, then fear is, the experience of fear itself is not a fear. You know, but fear of fear is the greatest fear. So if you really analyze and cut down, you will see that, you know. When you really experience, it's not fear. In a concept about fear, thought, the fear of fear becomes more, actually, uh, what we struggle with, usually. Thank you. <clears throat> In the very beginning um, tonight, you said that um, Siddhartha's father was very skillful mm -hmm. in hiding suffering. Uh -huh. Did you say after that that our community is also 
skillful at hiding something. Yes. Could you explain a little bit what you meant by that? <laughs> Generally, in our in this world, our world of twenty uh, first century, uh, developed countries, you know, we have a lot of uh, ways to hide our suffering. Like, for example, you know, hiding uh, <coughs> the suffering of death as much as possible. You know. Like you don't see much about that or talk about that or facing it. You know, uh, when somebody dies, we use words like expired, <laughs> <laughs> something like passport, you know, it's a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> also, the words that we choose, you know, like, yeah. And so, therefore, there's a lot of different ways in a modern world that we are hiding our suffering, you know, pushing them to the outside of our usual life. You know, the city continues, you know, with the full of life and the full of this that. But all the sufferings when it happens, then we pick them and put them somewhere out, outside in the corner. So we don't see them uh, see the suffering. So there's a lot of uh, things like that, you know, happening in our world. And uh, One year when I was traveling, <clears throat> the topic of death in Iran was a very hot topic in the West. Uh, they were talking about it a lot, and then I met someone who told me, and he said, everybody wants to talk about death in Iran, but nobody wants to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I feel sometimes, that you know, in our world, not only here, but everywhere in the world. Like, you know, sometimes we like to talk about it, but when you really face it, you want to run away from it. Mm -hmm. So, from there we can see our talking about it is not so genuine sometimes. Does that mean? Thank you. 